it is my pleasure to be here with you all, and I'm looking forward to sharing what I understand to be the message of truth, at least trying to find a little bit more in depth in regard to the three angels' messages. We're going to be looking today at chapter 14, verse 11 in the book of Revelation. We have tried to parse some of the thoughts in the first, second, third angels' messages, and right now entering into the third, well, we're already in the third, but entering Continuing on in the third, we're going to try to find out a little bit more about some of the things that may cause questions and some of the things that may um, be misunderstood as well. So I'm going to try to find a couple of words and see how they're used in the Bible. And then we're going to try to conclude what it is saying and also what it's not saying, because that's important. I'm going to share my screen. We've just prayed and I thank you for sharing uh, our prayer, Jose. I appreciate it. So we're going to um, look together now at Revelation 14, verse 11. And what it's saying is, The smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. So today I think we're going to look at the idea of smoke. The reason why is we're going to be partaking of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture, into the cup of his indignation. And they're going to be tormented with fire and brimstone, right? And this torment and the fire and brimstone is what is important to look at, I think, and because it's talking about the smoke of their torment. Well, if you know anything about fires, <clears throat> you know that if you see smoke, it's because there is either flame or it's very hot, okay? Sometimes there can be smoke without flame. And you can even put out a flame and still the smoke is rising, right? So the smoke of their torment will be seen or ascending up forever and ever. So I'm going to look at this word smoke real quick. I'm going to search for this key number and find out that there's 13 different times that this word is used. And we're going to look at those 13 times. I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath blood and fire and vapor of smoke. Now, so even the first time this word is used in the Greek in the New Testament is it's coupled with the word vapor. Now I know the word vapor means a mist, okay? So just it's not a hidden meaning at all. It's just a mist or a vapor of smoke. The word smoke itself is smoke. It doesn't have another translation. That's just the way that the word is. But it's a mist or a vapor of smoke. And you know what I'm talking about. You've seen smoke before. Smoke arises and you can see through it if it's thin or if it's not a very thick smoke. The thicker it gets, the harder it is to see through it. It's very much just like mist. If you have a little bit of mist in the morning, you can see through it. You can see, you know, past your driveway or whatever it is out your window, your trees or the mountains. But if it's a thick cloud, that is mist and you're not able to see through it. So this right here is the first time it's used. It's a vapor of smoke. And we can see that uh, most of the time smoke, if it's not billowing like it was in Canada, like we just learned about from Jacob, then it's something you can see through. You can always see through smoke in some sense because it, it does have um, light travels through it. Anyways, is what I meant to say. So now here, this idea of the vapor of smoke, it's the first time it's used. The rest of the times it is in the book of Revelation, starting in 8.4 all the way through to chapter 19, right? So we're going to go ahead and see what it says. It's the smoke of the incense. Well, that's what's in the hand of the Lord there, and it represents the prayers of the saints. So the smoke of the incense is something that we can learn in the sanctuary. So the sanctuary is where you find that first altar of incense. It's in the holy place right in front of the veil that is um, actually held up by uh, wood. It's not even touching the ground. So it's suspended between heaven and earth, just like Christ was on the cross. That's why the veil is referred to as his flesh in the book of Hebrews. So it's the smoke of the incense, and it comes up with the prayers of the saints. And this smoke is very likely like a vapor. The reason being is the altar of incense was not very big. Okay, so is about, I think it's two, and a half, two meters or so, six feet. I don't remember. No, I think that's the one outside. Anyways, on the inside, the altar of incense was not that big. I don't remember the exact uh, dimensions of it. But it wasn't big enough to make a pillar of smoke 
thick enough not to see through. So even here, it's a vapor of smoke, right? It, though it doesn't say it, we just know from the dimensions of the incense altar. 9 verse 2. He opened the bottomless pit and there arose a smoke out of the pit. Now, I don't know how big this bottomless pit is, but I know the earth is referred to as a bottomless pit, and that's pretty big. So when there's smoke that comes out of this pit, and this smoke, by the way, is from the enemy, that dark angel that comes down and in verse 1. I'm actually going to read it real quick. Read verse 1. It says, The fifth angel sounded, I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth. And we know what star fell from heaven in an evil way, according to chapter 12. That was Lucifer. And afterwards, you know, called Satan. And to him was given the key to the bottomless pit. And this key, when he used it, he opened the bottomless pit. And there was a smoke that actually made the sun and the air of, uh, you know, that, that it was in dark. And so this smoke was billowing. This, this was not a vapor of smoke. This was a very thick one, right? Because it was able to block the sun and cause the air to be darkened by reason of that smoke. So I truly believe this is referring to the Dark Ages where light was being, um, how would you say, considered illegal in some cases, but they were also the, this was the, the enemy of God rising up a people that was causing the sun, like the light of the earth, to be darkened. And the air was receiving a deadly taint as well. Of course, these are being symbolic, the sun and the air, representing that the uh, darkness was coming into the world. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth. And that smoke was what darkened the sun, right? Locusts, we know, can be equated to the, the enemy in some cases in the Bible. Now, I saw in this uh, vision... There was horses, and them that sat on them, having breastplates of fire, jacinth, brim, brimstone, and the heads of the horses were as the heads of lions. Out of their mouths issued fire and smoke and brimstone. Some people have referred to this section as uh, during the time where those that were at war had the ability with muskets and guns to be able to shoot smoke and various brimstone, if you will, out of their barrels. And so the smoke here would be uh, like a vapor, something that really doesn't have much fire at all. There is fire that causes the smoke, but the smoke is then gone after a time. Now in chapter 9, verse 18, By these three was the third part of men killed, by the fire, by the smoke, which is referred to in verse 17, and by the brimstone which issued out of their mouths. And so there again would be the same kind of idea as the uh, long rifles or muskets, etc., that have the brimstone being cast out with the smoke, kind of like a long rifle would. Um, Revelation 14, 11, And the smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night, who worship the beast in his image, who have receives his mark of his name. And this is the verse we're looking at, this smoke idea. We're talking about a smoke that is likely like a vapor, but it's also a smoke that came as a result of fire. Now, I'm going to come back to this verse because we're going to look at it again uh, before we're finished, but let me go through the rest of these verses before we contemplate that one further. The temple, that's the temple in heaven, according to this context, was filled with smoke. Now, what smoke was this from? Was this from a fire? Well, yes, actually, because God is a consuming fire. So it's smoke from the glory of God and from his power. No man could enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. So in verse 9 of chapter 18, they're going to see the smoke of her burning. This is Babylon being consumed with, with fire. And because she's burning, there's smoke. Okay, 18 verse 18, And they cried when they saw the smoke of her burning. Same concept, the smoke of her burning. Saying, What city is like unto this great city? Now, the great city, we know that uh, that term is only used for three cities in the Bible, and that would be Nineveh, Babylon, and Jerusalem. And here, Babylon's being burnt, and as a result of that, they're crying out. Well, in chapter 19, verse 3, at the time where Christ is about to come, Alleluia, her smoke rose up forever and ever. Now, the smoke rose up forever and ever. Remember that? So there is smoke of her burning, 
It does not say her flames rose up forever and ever. That's really important. Smoke comes from burning. There's no question. You can see that with just anything that burns on the earth, and it's even the same way in the Bible. And so the smoke of her torment, if you will, rose up forever and ever. Now, that's the concept that we find here in these verses, that smoke is something that comes as a result of fire. Now, Revelation chapter 14, verse 11, deals with the smoke of their torment ascending up forever and ever, similar to what was just described there in chapter 19. And yes, I believe that is true. It will be something that we can see throughout the ceaseless ages, if you will, the smoke, the effect of the judgments that came from God upon Babylon. The smoke of their torment, so it's the smoke, not the flames. I'm, I'm making a real um, emphasized point here that it's the smoke of their torment ascends up forever. It never says the flames of their torment ascends up forever. And that's really important because we know that God does not burn everybody throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity. We've already talked about forever and ever. We've learned that this is applied to the fires that were given to Sodom and Gomorrah, which fires started and which fires ended. And so according to eternal flames, like what you can read in Jude 1 verse 7. In fact, let me just bring it up real quick. Jude 1 verse 7. Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh are set forth an example suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Now the fire would not be put out as long as it took until it burnt up Sodom and Gomorrah. And so as a result, this fire was eternal. But what's, what's interesting about this is the fire started in Sodom and it ended after it had destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, right? So this eternal fire had a beginning and an ending. That's really important when we're understanding this concept. So it's not flames that go up forever and ever, it's smoke that goes up forever and ever. And I think that's important because what we're learning here is that God has a finished uh, judgment. Remember, we looked at before that it is something that is not a continuation of torment. It is a finished act. Everlasting destruction is what the Bible says, or everlasting punishment. Not everlasting destructing or everlast everlasting punishing. These concepts are very important to understand when you're dealing with people that have the concept that God burns somebody forever and ever throughout the ceaseless ages future. He won't do that. You can't find it in the Bible. There are some verses that make it seem that way. This one, just taken by itself, could. But we're not going that direction because that's not what the Bible teaches. So as a result of being able to learn a little bit more about smoke, the concept of smoke comes from fire. Yes, it does. But the smoke is going to ascend, not the flames. So knowing that, it's very interesting. But it's also in the mix of this time where these people aren't even dead. But let's understand what I mean by saying that. It says, the smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever, and they have no rest, day nor night, who worship. Wait a minute. These people that have a smoke that ascends up forever and ever, and ever they're not resting while they worship. You can't be dead and have your, the smoke of your punishment ascending, and you're still worshiping, right? It doesn't make sense at all. That especially if you know and understand that when you die, you don't worship. When you die, you don't sing. You don't praise the Lord. You don't think. You don't have any love or thoughts. You don't have any hatred. These things are all perished, according to the Bible. So they, who's they? Well, those that were tormented and those that have smoke ascending up for our never and ever. They have no rest day nor night. Who worship the beast in his image and whosoever receives the mark of his name. I could say to you that, yes, this refers to those that have been punished with flames and their smoke is going up. But I could also say, and I think appropriately, that these people, the smoke of their torment ascends up while they're living. Now, what do I mean? The Bible says in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, that you and me can offer ourselves up to God as a what kind of sacrifice? As a living sacrifice, right? 
And so a living sacrifice actually has something coming up. It's like a smoke. It's actually called an odor or a savor. Okay, I'll show you which, what I mean here in this section of um, 2 Corinthians 2, verse 14. Now thanks be to God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ. So always. That word is very important. God, and we praise God, we give thanks to him because he always gives us triumph or victory in Christ. And he makes manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. Now, what is a savor? A savor is an odor, a fragrance. You know, what's interesting is an odor and a fragrance is very similar to smoke. Now, I get it. It's not the same thing, but it's very similar. What I mean is that smoke ascends and in the same way, odor ascends as well, right? If you put on perfume, for example, well, you can just sit there. You can just sit without moving. And somebody would come into the room and say, wow, that's really nice. I like the way you smell, right? Why? Because odor is actually ascending. It's, it's dissipating around the room. The same thing with smoke. If you have a little bit of a incense burning on the side of the house, it's not, you're not just going to smell it right there where it's burning. It's going to fill the whole house, kind of like the perfume does. So if we as living people, as those that have life and life more abundant, actually have a savor. And by the way, if, you're, if you've been around a fire and you smell like smoke, you walk in and people are like, you smell like smoke. Well, why? Because the smoke or the savor of the smoke is ascending, right? It's dissipating. And so you have this idea that humans actually have a savor. It's like smoke that ascends. And we're to offer our lives a living sacrifice, acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service. And of course, it's reasonable because God gave his son to live his life on this earth. We ought to live our lives on this earth as well. Because Christ has life and we've been given life as well. So our reasonable sacrifice is to offer up to God a living sacrifice. Now, living, what does that mean? Well, we have life. Okay, we're living sacrifices. And we have odors or smoke, if you will, some kind of savor coming from us. Do you know that the enemy and his crew, those that don't follow God, they also have that same kind of savor or smoke, or incense, if you will, coming forth from them. So even as they're alive, they have some kind of smoke ascending. And see, the difference is that those that follow Christ, they have rest. They have a peace that passes understanding. But the Bible says there is no rest for the weary. There's no rest for the wicked, right? And you have this idea that we can have rest in Christ, and it's a savor of life unto life. They can have no rest in Christ, and they still have a life a savor, but it's not life unto life. It's actually death unto death. Let's continue this section here. Thanks be to God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ, and makes manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ. In them that are saved and in them that perish, right? To the one, we are a savor or a smoke or an incense of death unto death. And to the other, we are a savor, a smoke or an incense of life unto life. And the question comes, who is sufficient for these things? Like really, we are actually those that are going to help some from life unto life? Or we're going to be one that causes others to go from death unto death? Who is sufficient for these things? Like, this is a high calling. But the reality is, as it says there in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, I beseech thee therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. By the way, these living sacrifices are like a sweet savor in the nose of the Lord, right? That's what it says in various places in the Bible. A living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Why do you need a brainwashing or a mind washing? It's because your brain or your mind has been completely defiled by the things of this world. 
And so the renewing of your mind is in order. That, here's why, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, what am I saying in all of this? Well, here's, here's part of what I'm saying. We have this idea that um, God has called us to be a savor or a smoke, to have some kind of odor on us. Well, in the same way, the enemy has odor or savor or smoke on him and those that follow him. So you're either helping people toward heaven as a savor of life unto life, or you're helping people toward hell as a savor of death unto death. Really, the choice is yours. Those that are in Revelation 14, I'll share it again here, Revelation 14, 11, the smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever. Now, sure, the smoke of their torment. Well, think about it. If they don't have rest, because, you know, those that follow the Lord, they have rest. And it's the patient saints that have that rest. What, what is it that they do to get that rest? They keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Now, it is that they keep the commandments. And it is how by the faith of Jesus. We can't keep the commandments by ourselves, but we can do it by the faith of Jesus. These people, they are tormented day and night because they don't have that faith of Jesus. They don't have something that is peace that passes understanding. So their torment is because they don't have their connection with God. But those who worship God, they do have rest, not torment. You see? So there's a big contrast between those that follow the Father and His Son compared to those that follow the beast and His image. So I should have said the Father and His image and the beast and His image. You have peace, you have torment. What do I mean? Well, interestingly, just yesterday I was presenting a message in um, Australia, here from my home, and just doing it through Zoom, and I want to share with you a section of what I found. It's, it's, I think it's quite interesting. I'm going to go to Matthew chapter... 15 and verse 22 and then 28. So behold, a woman of Canaan, she came out of the same coasts and cried unto the Lord, which is Jesus, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. Now why would she be crying out? My daughter, my daughter is grievously vexed with a devil. So now this woman is crying out for the mercies of the Lord which is the mercies of the son of David, right? She knows who he is. She has applied the history of the Bible to this man named Jesus Christ, the son of David. She believes he is the fulfillment of prophecy, but she's from Canaan, right? You can read later that the disciples didn't have a real soft heart for her because, of course, they thought she was, you know, a Canaanite. Get her away. But the Lord was doing things there at this time to uh, reveal what was in the disciples' heart. So not needing to go on further into the story, we can just see that she was crying out for mercy. Well, she was crying out for her daughter. Why was she crying out for her daughter? The daughter is grievously vexed with a devil. Notice what Jesus says. Jesus says, woman, after he discusses with her a little bit, ah, well, first he ignored her and then he discussed with her. Woman, great is your faith. Be it unto you, even as your desires are, even as you will. Now watch this. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. Okay, wait a minute. She was made whole? What does that mean? She was, she was actually fulfilled, right? She was healed. She was made whole. She was cured. But to be made whole, you need to first have to be less than whole. And so what if this woman, this daughter, was being vexed with a devil? Well, she was. But what if she was only a quarter there? It wasn't really all of her. She, was, it, it, she wasn't what she was supposed to be. She was not whole. What if she was half and the devil was, was affecting her to the point where she wasn't 100%, she was only 50? What if she was 75? She still wasn't whole yet. No matter how much the devil was vexing her, this demon, which is an angel fallen, however much this demon was vexing her, she wasn't allowed to be her whole potential self. And without being her whole potential self, she didn't have rest. She was tormented by this demon. 
And I would suggest that the same thing is happening to those people that are worshiping the beast in his image rather than the father in his image. These people are being influenced by the demons and they are vexed. They are being not whole. They are either a quarter, a 10%, 50%, 75%, whatever it is, but they don't have their fullness. They don't have their wholeness. And as a result, what does it say? It's the smoke of their torment. So the word vexed and tormented is very similar. This daughter was vexed by the devil. These people in Revelation chapter 14, the third angel, is being tormented by the, uh, you know, the, their, their, the smoke of their torment. Well, their, their torment is that they're not walking with the Lord. They don't have that peace. And so regularly, they are less than whole. It's because the demons are connected to them rather than the, the spirit of peace, the spirit of Christ. And of course, they would be walking with holy angels rather than walking with uh, evil demons. And so this idea of they being tormented by their smoke that is ascending, I think could be referred to as a living experience. Now, they're not living more abundantly like the Christians are, but they are living. Why? Because they were given probation, just as we have been given. So this idea in Revelation chapter 14, I think, can be understood as that these people could be living, and the smoke is that, that savor that ascends, just like it ascends from you Christians, the, sa the smoke or savor of their torment because they don't have the peace that passes understanding, that will ascend up forever and ever. We will always know throughout the ceaseless ages what it is like to walk without Christ in your life. And the reason why we would is because we have already gone through those books. We've already seen in Revelation chapter 20 the various activities that God had tried to do in the lives of these people and how they had refused the ministering spirits in favor of the evil demons. They were never whole. They were tormented their whole life. And as a result, the smoke of that torment will ascend up. Well, guess what? The savor of our experience will also ascend up. You can read that in Ephesians 2 and also in uh, Revelation 15 where it says, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Great and true are thy ways. I, I don't remember exactly. Uh, <clears throat> Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. For thy judgments have been made manifest. We're going to be able to see the judgments of the Lord, whether somebody is saved or whether they are lost. And we're going to be able to see the smoke ascending from those that have been saved and the smoke ascending from those that have been lost because of their living experiences, not necessarily their being destroyed in the flames of hell. So, but I do believe it could apply to that as well. So I'm not saying that it only has to be the way I'm saying it. I'm just saying it could apply this way. And that would mean that your life will be a testimony throughout the ages, not just your burning necessarily. Now, of course, you're burning because your life was that way. But my point is that the life is why you are not with those people in heaven. And your life is why you are with those people in heaven. You'll be judged according to your works, whether you've followed the Lord or whether you have not followed the Lord. So it seems to me that this could be better understood in the light that these people have a smoke ascending because of their life, not because of their death. So if you disagree with me, I'm okay with that. This is a newer understanding for me. And if I'm wrong, please help me to understand. But it seems like in my mind, it has a lot of validity. Anyways, the smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night. When? when they are worshiping the beast and his image, and they whosoever receives the mark of his name. You can't worship the beast in his image or receive the mark of his name if you're dead. But you can if you're alive, and the smoke of your torment because of your, your not whole life is being lived out in a very, how would you say, um, oh, non-joyous way. I guess I could say that a way that is non, not fulfilling. When I was a Christian, I had a lot of fun. I, I certainly did. I, I thought life was great. But there was a hole in my heart that I didn't know how to fill. Well, I would fill it with alcohol and drugs, and that was part of the way I got through life, and I had a good time doing it. But I'll tell you, that is not the way I would rather have compared to the life that I have with, excuse me, with God. The life that I now have with God is way beyond in fulfillment and excitement in surprises and joy in life compared to the life that I used to have. So 
for 25 years now, plus I've been a Christian. I know how to go back to that old life. I can do it today if I wanted to. I can go get alcohol and drugs and I know how to get all the stuff I used to have. I could do it right now if I want to. I'm not an idiot. But I would rather have the Christian life. So I don't want to live a life that was tortured and that was not whole. I want to live a life with peace and that is whole. And so um, I want my life to be a savor of life unto life rather than death unto death. And of course, one life is for life unto life or for death unto death, depending on who's receiving it as well. So you can read that as we've already read in 2 Corinthians. But the point is here that these people are alive. They're worshiping the beast in his image. And these people have no rest while they're alive. And these people have received a mark of his name. But in contrast to those that are alive, worshiping the beast in his image with no rest, these people here are the patient saints, which have rest. They are keeping the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. I think right here what we're seeing is a contrast between those that do worship the beast and his image compared to those that do worship the Father and his image. And I like the idea of these people being alive because now their life is a testimony rather than their death. And here, their life is a testimony rather than their death. But of course you could see that Blessed are they which die in the Lord from henceforth. And so their death would be a testimony as well. So you could argue either way. But the point is that I feel as though it has a lot of validity that these people could be referred to as alive. Now, no rest. What does that mean? No rest. I'm going to check that out for just a brief moment. If you go to Matthew chapter 12, you scroll up a little bit, you're going to see that Jesus says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. That's like the torment, right? These people are tormented. They're giving off a savor of death unto death by their lives. Come unto you, or sorry, come unto me, all you that are tormented. You are laboring and are heavy laden. I will give you what? Rest. Remember those in the Mark of the Beast scenario, they don't have rest. They haven't come to Jesus. They're laboring, they're burdened, they are tortured, tormented. But Jesus wants to give them rest. So, come unto me, okay? Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. You don't have rest for your souls right now, but you're still alive. In fact, your souls are tormented right now. But I want you to find rest for your souls, your life, your very being. Because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Okay? So this seems to me to go very well with the Mark of the Beast and Seal of God scenario that we find in the third angel. Well, what's interesting about this section is he's appealing for people to publicly come to him. He's making a public appeal. Come to me. Come up to the altar, if you will. I'm going to pray with you right here in front of the pulpit. That's what we do in the churches sometimes, right? Come unto me, all you that labor. I will give you rest. And it says, notice in verse 1 of chapter 12, At that time. At what time? At the time that he had just said, Come unto me, I will give you rest. At that time, Jesus went on the Sabbath day through the corn. Wait a minute. The Sabbath day? The Sabbath day, we're told, according to Hebrews chapter 4, is a day that is for rest, right? What does it say? Hebrews chapter 4 and verse, um, no, not verse 12, sorry. Right here, verse 9. There remains, therefore, a rest to the people of God. What, what is this rest? I'm going to show you what this rest is. Sabbatismos, okay? A sabbatism. This is a repose of Christianity, a type of heaven, sure, okay, maybe, but it's really a, it is because it's a type of Canaan land, and that's what chapter four and, and three and four of Hebrews are talking about. But this Sabbatism is actually a Sabbath that is a rest for these people. Okay, so Paul is even saying there remains therefore a Sabbath rest to the people of God, and you can find that there's no question that he's talking about God entering the rest that he did in the days of creation. God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And that's the rest that is remaining for us in verse 9, right? So this idea of Jesus coming at that time on the Sabbath day through the corn, 
what is he doing for these people? Well, he said, Come unto me, I will give you rest, and your souls will find rest. I will teach you about the Holy Sabbath. Come with me, I'll show you how to keep the Sabbath. And I really like that because what we're seeing there is that Christ is offering to his um, people, those that are listening to him in this crowd, he's saying, come to me, I will give you what you don't currently have. Your souls are tormented. You don't have rest, you don't have peace, but I'll give it to you. One of the ways I'll give it to you is the Sabbath day. Come with me, I'll teach you how to pick corn on the Sabbath day. Of course, they're not going to harvest corn, they're just going to eat it. And the Pharisees are going to get upset because, of course, they are about the letter of the law rather than the spirit and the letter. Do you see my point? In Revelation chapter 14, verse 11, you can read that these people, they don't have the, pay, the peace and the rest that Christ has offered and wants to give them. Their souls are tormented. They don't have the rest because they're not keeping the seventh-day Sabbath with Christ. What they're doing instead is they're following the image of the beast, and they're keeping his day instead of Christ's day. They don't have rest doing it when they are worshiping the beast in his image, right? Or receiving his mark. But those that are contrary, those that are actually patient saints, they are keeping the Sabbath with Christ. And as a result, they do have peace, and they have the faith of Jesus. So I like that difference there between those that are alive uh, without the Lord and those that are alive with the Lord. These have life, and these have life. But these have life more abundantly, as John chapter 10 talks about. So the smoke of their torment seems to be that we're able to understand it in such a way that their life is giving off a savor that is proof that they do not have the peace or the rest that God has offered. So I'm wondering, what are your thoughts in contrast to my presentation today in light of perhaps what you have understood in the past? Is this something that you feel like makes sense? Or no, this is not it because we need to understand it a different way. I'd like to hear what you want to say or what you'd like to say. I, I think that when it talks about the, the smoke of their torment, yeah, they're being tormented, and, and as a result, their life puts off that torment. Um, and even, I love everything that you've said, and even I think that their, what they do and what they say in their lives is going to affect people even after they've left the room. Right. That smoke, just like when this morning when I was out looking and I realized, you know, it's it rained for three days and then yesterday it didn't rain, yet there was smoke still covering the mountains. Today I wake up and the smoke, the wind is blowing the smoke in through my house. But then when I go for my walk, that wind had subsided and finally for the first time I can see the mountains. There's their smoke, even after they left the room, is still bothersome to others. Right. While when we leave the room, if we're in Christ, what we do and say affects others even after we have left. It lingers. Amen. I like it. Yes. Steve, go ahead. Um, I, when you mention that smoke, uh, the only definition of smoke is smoke. Uh, in the Greek, it also means an uncertain affinity. I don't know if that has anything to play into what you were saying. Uh, and also, smoke uh, chemically is an unburned fuel. That's what the, uh, I was on the fire department for 21 years, and smoke is an unburned fuel. So you're right, it doesn't have to have a flame, but there has to be some kind of a heat source to create this, this, uh, uh, the product that's burning to be unburned. And uh, do you have notes on when you talk about forever and ever the def, uh, where we can uh, because I've heard you say it three or four times but what you it still hasn't sunk in on me you right. know the difference between forever and ever and there is a beginning and there's an end I was wondering if you did have notes on that I did and it was one of the first I think it was the first presentation I did on the uh, three Angels, which I'll be releasing pr pretty soon. I'm going to start releasing this series sooner than the Matthew one. And I've already got it edited. It's already up online. It just needs to go through uh, the process of being viewed and then okayed. But uh, 
there, the first thing we looked at was everlasting gospel. We looked at the word everlasting. And we were able to see what the Bible says about it and what it doesn't. So, yeah, it'll come out soon, the notes with that. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no problem. And then Jacob had his hand, and then Mark. Uh, just in regard to um, those that have the mark of the beast and um, them not having any rest day or night, I definitely feel like that's connected to um, the Sabbath or them having the false false day, the Sunday not having rest because Sabbath is is the day of rest for us. I definitely feel like there's a connection there with that. Amen. Yes, um, two things that I wanted to mention here. First, I want to ask you if the word rest in verse 11 translates to Sabbath, or is it I mean, is it, how does that word translate? And the other thing is that the spirit of prophecy says that not all that is to be understood about the, about the mark of the beast is yet revealed, has yet been revealed. Well, if you go down to verse 13, it says, Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Right, blessed are those, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now, on, which we understand as 1844, when the message the first angel's message was given. Right. So that brought us out of the Trinity into the into the true spirit of Christ. And then it says, yes, says the spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. So it seems to me that the, that the one true God and Jesus Christ as the Holy Spirit is coming out in this as well as the rest. I was wondering if that translates Sabbath because I, I agree with the last... The, the guy that just spoke, but to me it says that they don't have rest because they're not keeping God's Sabbath. They're not worshiping the one true God. Right. Until 1844 when that angel's message came out. Then it says, yes, says the spirit that they might have. So we need the, the proper spirit and the right day of worship, which is God's day, in order to be right with God. Right, yeah. So that, no, I agree with Jacob as well. That was part of my intention was to show that if you don't have rest, it's because you're not keeping the Sabbath with Christ, as he did in Mark, uh, Matthew chapter 12. But let me look here. I'm pretty sure this is not the same rest. This is an intermission, an implication of recreation. This is not the same kind of rest that is talked okay. about in Hebrews chapter 4. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Any other comments? I liked how you tied in Matthew 11, um, 28 through 30. Um, when I was, you know, when I was in the corporate church, I loved them verses, but I don't think I really had a great rest even in the church. And for so many years I was in and out of the church because I would come in, I missed God, I missed the church, but then I didn't agree. And I would leave. Where do you go when you leave? You go back out into the world. Mm. <laughs> I was kind of in the same place both times. But as I, you know, a couple of years ago, I found my paperwork. It's been two years almost to the date that when I started going, why don't I agree with the church? But um, started really studying online and trying to find if there's other people that are thinking like me and have always been thinking like me. Um, I... It's, it's been about two years, but um, none of this, we can't do any of this by ourselves or even, you know, if we're in, have false thinking. But he says, take, a, um, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. If you yoke two animals together, you yoke the younger one with the older one that knows what he's doing. Right. And that younger one... He, if he doesn't fight against the the learned animal, he um, it's easy for him. The the older animal takes up most of the weight of of the work, and the, the younger one can just learn of him. That's what I'm getting now. I'm finally getting that. Amen. I've got people that know what I've been searching for. I've. Um, <laughs> I'm in that yoke now. <laughs> Praise the so Lord. I'm thankful for that. That's great. Amen. Uh, of a truth I say to you, that he will take 
him ruler over all that he hath, or make him. But if that servant say in his heart, My Lord delays coming, and shall begin to beat the med servants and the maid servant, uh, sorry, men servants and maid maidens, and to eat and to drink and be drunken, the Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looks not for him, and at an hour when he is not aware, and will cut him in sunder, and will appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. This is when the Lord is coming, right? This is the separation between the sheep and the goats. And that servant which knew his master's or Lord's will, and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, he shall be beaten with many stripes. So this servant knew his Lord's will, but did not prepare. But he that knew not, and did commit things worthy of stripes, shall be beaten with few stripes. For unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall much be required. And to whom men have committed much, of him they will ask the more. So this is the point right here, really. If there is a servant that knows the Lord's will, but does not prepare, because he knew and he didn't do anything about it, he will be punished in a greater way than somebody who knew not, yet did those things that were wrong. He didn't know. And he will be punished, but with few stripes. So really, it depends on what you know. And that's why James chapter 3 says, My brethren, be not many masters. In other words, don't be a teacher. Like, don't be a teacher unless God is calling you to be a teacher. Knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. Why the greater condemnation? Well, because we knew more, right? And remember, when Jesus was speaking with the woman who was about to anoint her, his feet with the oil, and uh, he wasn't speaking with her, he was speaking with, I think, Simon, I don't remember. Um, he said, which one would be punished more? Oh, no, 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 which one would love more? The one that is forgiven $50 or the one that's given $5 million, uh, forgiven $5 million? And of course, they're like, well, the one that's forgiven $5 million. He's like, right. So that's the same concept. You'll love more for how much you've been forgiven, but you'll also pun be punished more for how much you knew and didn't prepare for. Is that helpful? Oh, perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. God bless you.